This video is published under the Creative Commons license BYNCSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this video series on thermal unit operations. In this video I would like to start with a new, well it's not new, but it's a new chapter so to speak, unit operation namely solvent extraction. And first of all, since I'm aware that possibly for you chemical engineering thermodynamics happened a long time ago, so you listened to that lecture quite a long time ago, I would first like to do some recapitulation of the thermodynamics which are required to design solvent extraction processes. Now, what is the challenge actually for the thermodynamics? Well, if you do solvent extraction, what is actually the basis for that? I mean, we will discuss the details of that in the following uh, video a little bit more detail, but, but just to set, up, uh, set out, so to speak, the motivation for this, is that we have a liquid solution that contains one major component, which is called the primary solvent, for example. It's the uh, con it's containing a transfer component that you want to remove from that phase. So this phase consists already of two components. And now you are adding a second solvent, which pulls your transfer component into that second solvent, so that you in the end wind up with a so-called raffinate and an extract. Apparently this system contains three components. And so we need to describe the equilibrium, specifically the liquid-liquid equilibrium, in such a ternary system. If you remember possibly from the chemical engineering thermodynamics lectures, that can be described in a so-called ternary or triangular diagram. And that's exactly what we want to have a look at. I would like to do some recapitulation so that you are aware how that works, why it works, and how we can represent mixture compositions in this ternary diagram. And then afterwards you want to also derive or collect some information about how to deal with these ternary diagrams in practical or for practical purposes. So let's first start out to have a look at such a ternary diagram. How does it work and why does it work? Now a ternary diagram looks like that. So let me first write down possibly the title. So no, why doesn't that write? Ternary. diagram or triangular diagram, both is possible, both is used. Um, the diagram looks like that, it's a triangle, equal sided diagram, so length of all three sides should be identical, which of course is not really exactly fulfilled if I draw it here just by hand, but in principle that's how it should be uh, constructed. And then typically you find that the three corners are associated to the three components like that, one, two, and three. This implies already something, it namely implies that these corners correspond to these pure components. Now how does that work? In order to visualize that to a certain extent, let us start out to just choose any point, an arbitrary point, somewhere in this diagram. Let me choose a point for example, oh let's take this one. And what we now plot is actually lines which are parallel to the three sides of this triangular passing through that point. So if we take the horizontal, that's easiest I guess, it goes like that. So this is a horizontal line passing through that point. Same parallel to the left side, goes like this. And the same to this side, then we have a line somewhere running like that, should also be exactly parallel, which is of course only approximately drawn if I draw it here again by hand. So we see we have these three parallel lines parallel to the three sides of the triangle. And then we directly realize, since all of these lines are parallel, that actually the length of this line is the same as that, is the same as that. So here we have an equal sided a triangle again here as well, and here as well. We also realize that since this and that line is parallel, this and that is uh, parallel, it means, due to geometry rules, the length of this line has to be the same as that, the line, length of this line has to be the same as that. Now we can collect these things, and I want to mark them with different colors. 
Let's start out with the largest or the longest line, which is this one here. Yeah. So that, le the length of this line, so from this end point to that end point, is the same as the line here, is the same as the length of this line, because this is an equal-sided diagram. So that's the same as that, is the same as that. And then we said, actually, because this is parallel to that, and this is parallel to that, this line has the same length. This is the same, and that holds also on that side. So also, this one is identical. Then we can use another color, for example, let's take red, for example, and use and have a look at the second longest lines, which are these. Again, we have, as I said, an equal sided diagram here. So the length of this line is the same as that line, is the same as that line. And again, to, because of the same arguments as before, the length here is the same as the length here. So that's the same as well. And the length here is the same as the length here. So that's the same as well. Okay. Third line, let's use this pink color. This small triangle here, again equal sided diagram, these three sides have the same length, so that's the same as that, is the same as that, and for the same arguments, this is the same as that, and this is the same length as that. So that applies also here, it also applies here. And now stepping back, we see that on each side of this triangle we have all three colors united. Pink, blue, red, blue, red, pink, red, pink, blue. And now if we assume or we scale, so to speak, the length of one side to correspond exactly to unity, then we have three lines that add up to unity. And that reminds us of something that we know already, the so-called summation condition, because we know that the summation over all components, i equals 1 to k, k being the number of components, 3 in our system here, of the mole fractions, I should directly say, same holds for the weight or mass fractions, xi equals unity. So if this corresponds to unity, then these three line lengths correspond possibly to the three mole fractions. Now, how does that work? Well, I said already, the three corners, they carry these indices, one, two, three, which correspond to the three compositions or three components in the, in the system, the pure components. And as a consequence, the opposite side of the ternary diagram corresponds to the binary system that does not contain that component. So if we regard pure component one being in this corner, that means here in this line, here on this boundary line of this triangle, we are in the system consisting of component 2 and 3, no component 1. So it's a binary system between component 2 and 3. That it means the mole fraction of component 1 is 0 on this line, and as we move in this direction, the concentration of component 1, the mole fraction of component 1, is increasing until it reaches unity over here. Same also the other way around, so this is the pure component 3. This is the binary system 1, 2, which does not contain any component 3. So here x3 is 0 and it increases to reach unity over here. So here we have pure component 3, x3 equals 1, here x3 equals 0. So, and it scales linearly in between. Which means, of course, that, for example, this length here, as this point moves up, this length will increase, so that length corresponds to the x3. And we can directly plot that, I will use the corresponding colors. So from here to here, the length actually corresponds in that notation to the x3. This is component 2. If this line, so to speak, parallel to this binary boundary, moves in this direction, mole fraction of component 2 will increase, and that is exactly scaled by this magenta or pink color. And so that means that actually the length from here to there directly corresponds to the x2. And finally, of course, the same holds in this direction for component 1, and that the, the, the length that corresponds, so to speak, to this parallel line to that basis, which is opposite of component 1, means that this length here corresponds to the mole fraction of component 1. So the length of this arrow 
corresponds to x1. And then we know x1 plus x2 plus x3 correspond to the length of one side of the ternary diagram, which we have scaled to correspond to unity, so they add up to unity. So each point, we didn't choose it specifically, so each point in this ternary diagram corresponds or can be described by three lengths that define the position of that point such that these three lengths add up to unity. So each point corresponds, in other words, transferred now to our ternary system that we want to describe, corresponds to a composition in a ternary system where the three mole fractions add up to unity. So each point in here corresponds to a real mixture consisting of three components where the summation condition is fulfilled. And actually, you can do it vice versa, you can also do it the other way around. Defining any mixture with three mole fractions that add up to unity is or can be this, uh, positioned or corresponds to a point in this diagram. So each point corresponds to a mixture and each mixture corresponds to a point in the diagram. So you can read mixtures from the diagram or if you have mixtures in reality with a composition, you can plot that in this ternary diagram. Both things work. Okay, I mean, I have told already a little bit about how, how this diagram is read because it means now the closer you are to some corner, the more of that component is contained in the mixture, so you can really directly see, so to speak, a little bit about the compositions. Here you see it's in the vicinity of the corner of component 1, so it will contain lots of component 1, which is apparent. Also, you see it's a little bit more in, in, in that direction, which means it contains more component 3 than component 2, which is exactly the case as well. So the more you are in the direction of a corner, the more of that component is being contained. And the more you are to the opposite end, opposite side, so to speak, the more you are approaching the binary system, which does not contain that component. So if you are moving down here to this binary system, you are losing or the concentration of component 3 is decreasing until you are here where you don't have any component 3 in the system. So that way we can directly see how it works. Uh, now, of course, uh, having seen that, we also would like to describe the liquid equilibria, which we apparently need to describe for the solvent extraction. We would like to describe them in this ternary diagram as well. Okay, so we need to redraw that uh, and see how we can represent a liquid-liquid equilibrium. So let me first redraw the diagram schematically, and I should take care that some things are more or less appropriate, so that it's really horizontal, that the line, the length of the sides is more or less uh, identical. Then we have component 1, 2 and 3, that is a typical way to, to count the indices, so to speak, they will uh, counterclockwise. Uh, and then we want to represent in this diagram somehow a system where we have a beaker. Yeah, that shall be a beaker, where actually we have two phases in that beaker that we have generated. So the liquid-liquid equilibrium and the question is how to represent the compositions of these two equilibrium phases in this diagram. And of course we can analyze these two phases. So we know the composition or we can know the composition. Each of these phases corresponds to a ternary system where the summation condition has to be fulfilled, so we are able to describe it in the diagram. We find a point for this phase, we find a point for that phase. And now let's assume that, for example, if we plot it in orange, that the top phase, for example, corresponds to this pay, pay point and the bottom phase corresponds to that point. So the composition here is that and the composition here is that. Then from the general thermodynamics, we know that these two points can be connected with the so-called tie line. It's a straight line. The plotting straight lines on the laptop is always a little bit complicated. So this is a tie line. It's a straight connection, a straight line connecting both endpoints, sometimes with hyphen, sometimes without, depends. Uh, so this is the tie line connecting the two compositions that are in equilibrium that you find in such an ex equilibrium experiment. And now, of course, you can repeat this experiment with varying the overall composition in the system, so you generate other tie lines. And if you then connect all the endpoints of the tie lines, you wind up with a, apparently with a binodal curve. And in this case, it may, for example, run like that. 
And this is then the binodal. Binodal or binodal curve, whichever way you want it. And of course, you have a variety of tie lines in that system, so others may be running like this or like that. And I should also mention in liquid liquid uh, systems, there can be a so called critical demixing point, which is somewhere over here. So if you move up with your tie line, you shift the overall composition in that system and move up, so to speak, the two phases are getting more and more equal, and at that point, they are exactly becoming equal. So there you have a critical demixing point, which is, of course, I should mention that thermodynamically a little bit a challenge because there are special laws apply, so-called scaling laws. But since apparently if you are, would be having uh, technical, technical processes somewhere in this vicinity, moving back and forth with the composition only slightly, some trace impurities which shift your binodal a little bit, and you would be have, having a two-phase system or a homoge homogeneous system, that is not a good state for technical processes. So in technical process, you are staying away from that point. So you don't have to bother that the, about the specialties of that point. You can simply use the ordinary models that are actually not able to describe this scaling behavior appropriately. Uh, you can use them nevertheless to describe liquid equilibrium because for all technical purposes, the accuracy for that, uh, that they are not able to characterize the, 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 the critical point that doesn't need to bother you because you stay sufficiently far away from that. Of course, there are thermodynamic models that are able to describe these liquid-liquid equilibria, NRGL, Uniquack, and many other equations of state in principle as well, even though that's a little bit more complex to solve. But anyway, it can be done, and you have tools that allow to do that without any problem today. There are others, models that don't work, as you possibly remember from the thermodynamics lecture. The Wilson approach, for example, also activity coefficient model or GE model, does not work. It does not allow to describe liquid-liquid demixing. One thing one should also mention is, of course, that we have also a binary demixing between the system 1 and 2. So this lowest line, so to speak, I can actually plot it here in, in red as well. This corresponds to a tie line in the binary system of component 1 and 2 as well. So that's a tie line as well. So you have this behavior. The slope of the tie line can be either way. It is apparently changing. It can also be changing back and forth a little bit. That strongly depends on the specifics of your ternary system that you are using, that you are regarding. So all thermodynamics can apply to that. You can model that, and this is how it looks in principle. Now, actually, there exists another way. So I should say this is a so-called type 1 miscibility gap, and there exists a so-called type 2 um, miscibility gap. I will show in just a moment, which is also sometimes occurring or is relevant for solvent extraction. There exist many more uh, types of uh, diagrams that can exist that uh, are essentially not practical for, liquid, uh, for solvent extraction. So uh, I don't need to mentioned that here, but just for thermodynamics reasons, so to, be, to, so to speak, to be complete, I should mention there are many other forms that can occur. So you can have three systems, three binary systems that have a miscibility gap, and then everything is getting really complicated. Now the second diagram I want to plot looks like that. So we have again our ternary diagram. I should plot that carefully as always. with the three components, one, two, and three. And now we want to assume that we have a miscibility gap here on the one, two, in the one, two system. And it can be that another binary system has a miscibility gap as well. Let's assume it's a two, three system, which has a miscibility gap as well. So there is a tie line, the demixing on that binary side as well. And then of course our uh, binodal splits into two branches. We have then one branch of a binodal somewhere over here, maybe it looks like that. How that actually is curved and how it looks like depends again on the specifics of your system. And up here you can have a system, a, a branch of the binodal as well, which may possibly look like that. It always depends which way it is curved. Everything is possible more or less. Thermodynamics can be quite challenging. And then of course you have more tie lines over here. Let me just plot three for the tie lines in the system, they can be running like that, for example. But everything holds as before, so these are the tie lines, and the blue ones are the binodals, which has now two branches. 
So far so good. We know now that we can describe the full thermodynamics of the system, also of the liquid-liquid equilibrium, in a ternary system by plotting it in such a ternary or triangular diagram. Well, the next thing I would like to look at is um, uh, a challenge that we sometimes have in the design, or actually frequently have, if in the design that we know one endpoint of a tie line and we would like to know the other endpoint. The reason for that is, as you know, we are typically combining equilibrium and balances, like the mesh uh, concept that we de discuss in the introductory lecture, also for the shortcut methods we had combinations or for the generalized description in the Mercator-Tilo diagram, we always have the combination between equilibrium and balances. And the balances lead to, uh, to an equation or some way to find one endpoint of a tie line and then we want to apply the equilibrium and that means that we have to find the other endpoint of the tie line. How that can that be done? So if, if that red line would be missing, for example, but we know that endpoint, how can we possibly find the other endpoint? And I want to show you one way to realize that. And I actually would like to discuss different options for that. The first option I have to draw this triangular diagram a little bit smaller, actually more or less half the size. So let's assume that it runs something like that. Again, components 1, 2 and 3. We have our binodal somewhere in the system. Actually, we'll get quite crowded in here, so I only plot, uh, well, let's say that I plot two of these tie lines. I also mark the critical demixing point and I want to remind us that this is a tie line as well. And what we want to do now is actually that we want to find a so-called auxiliary line. I will show in a moment how that looks like. And we want to construct that by plotting parallel lines through the endpoints of these tie lines. So we want to plot lines parallel to this through this endpoint and parallel lines to that side through that endpoint for all the tie lines. And they will of course apparently meet they have to meet, they have to intersect somewhere, and then we see actually that we can connect these intersection points, and that will be actually the auxiliary line. Now if I do that, I choose another color in this case. Uh, so I first plot the parallel lines parallel to that, through this endpoint, through that endpoint, and through that endpoint. If I do that, I hope it works out so that you can realize something like that. I don't need that. For, oh, I can, to plot that also, quite extended that, I guess, up to here somewhere. So I hope that is sufficient. Oh, and this also has to be a little bit longer, I guess. And then through the other end point, we would like to plot lines parallel to this side. And then we see that these lines actually intersect. So this intersects somewhere here. This point intersects somewhere here. And starting out from that end point, we intersect somewhere here. And then we see that we actually have a series, a sequence of different points. This point, this point, this point, and actually the critical demixing point belongs to that line as well, because if you... So this actually corresponds to two endpoints. The, the length of the tie line has become zero, so that corresponds to the length of the, the, the two endpoints of a tie line, the length of which has become zero, has shrunk to zero. And if we now plot to one endpoint, a line parallel to that, to the other through that, it will exactly meet at that point. So that point itself is the limiting case, so to speak, of that line that I want to plot. And let's plot it in black, for example. This is in the so-called auxiliary line by just combining these points that we have just generated. And typically, the slope and the curvature of that um, so-called auxiliary line doesn't change so much. It's, well, it's not really a straight line, but the, it's only slightly bent. So you can easily plot it, typically. Well, usually you don't have this back and forth, so there's a bump in here, but if you have real systems, you plot it exactly. It typically doesn't have such a bump. That is the so-called auxiliary line. Sometimes also called conjugate line. 
And this line actually now helps to answer exactly the question that I posed before. If I know one endpoint uh, of a tie line, let's assume somewhere here for example, how can I find the other endpoint? I will do that with another color. Which color can I use? Let's take brown for example, well, let's take green I guess, light green, I hope one can see that later on. Now let's take the dark green I guess. So if we start out somewhere over here for example, and we would like to know the other endpoint corresponding to that endpoint of a tie line. So we know from the balances this is one endpoint of a tie line. Where is the other end? So that we can plot the tie line. Then we simply plot now through this endpoint a line parallel to that until we hit the conjugate line. And then through that intersection point we plot the line parallel to the other side until we hit the binodal. Then we actually have the other endpoint. So we plot a line like this until we until we hit the conjugate line. Then we plot a line through that intersection point with the conjugate line until we hit the binodal and then we know that this actually is the tie line that we have been looking for. So we have construct constructed this tie line just from knowing one endpoint. Of course it works the other way around. If you know this point you do it just the other way around and find again your tie line that belongs to one endpoint uh, of that tie line. I should also say that, I mean, this is nice with the auxiliary line. It can be drawn quite easily. I prefer actually this way, but there exist other ways to realize that. I want to mention them as well. I don't like it so much because they are relatively crowded and that for students sometimes a little bit uh, too complicated, I guess. So it's, uh, let me plot it again and then we will see in just a moment what I mean. Uh, I plot it a little bit bigger because now everything will stay inside the ternary diagram and that's why I believe it's getting relatively crowded, so I prefer it the other way around. So I prefer it just as I've plotted uh, just before. But of course, we again have our binodal. We also have our tie lines. Let's again plot just two. And of course, this side is a tie line as well. And of course, in principle, we also here have a critical demixing point. And what we now do is actually that we plot, um, we, we, that we choose two different, two other sides. So before we had these two sides through which we have plotted our parallel lines, now let's choose this and let's say this one. Now what we are doing actually, we are using uh, plotting parallel lines to this endpoint, uh, to this side through one endpoint of the tie line and again through the other endpoint parallel to the other side. Well, I possibly should, if I do it like that, I should choose this one. You can, you can use either one, but uh, as, if you do it as I just showed you, if you want to go parallel to that, that parallel line should go here and that should be going through that, then you find points over there. So what I want to do, I want to use this parallel, this par par lines parallel to this endpoint passing through this and lines parallel to, to that to that endpoint. So if I do that, First start out with horizontal lines parallel to this one through those endpoints. And then lines parallel to this through the other endpoints of the tie lines. And they will also intersect. So one point of intersection is here, another one is there. Again, because the tie line has a zero length at the critical, that's a point of that curve as well. And also, if we regard the lowest tie line, of course, horizontal through that endpoint is the tie line itself. Parallel to this side, through that endpoint, will intersect that line exactly at that point. So that point itself is one point of this uh, auxiliary line that we are constructing that way. And then our auxiliary line runs like that. It connects these points. Again, it's a little bit bumpy. In reality, that would be not as bumpy. It would be have a relatively smooth curvature. But if you would combine these points, you again find an auxiliary line. As I said, I, I personally find that a little bit too crowded in the diagram, so I prefer to in the, the first way, but in many textbooks you also find it that way. And of course, you can also do it the other way around. So we have now chosen this uh, side and that side. And of course, you can also choose this side and that side. But then you have to reverse, so to speak, the sides. Then uh, this parallel to that has to run through this point here and there. And then you get your 
um, uh, auxiliary line as well. Also, the reverse works identically, so no problem. Now we have seen that we can plot the miscibility gap in the Turner diagram. We have this auxiliary line to find the tie line once we know only one endpoint of the tie line. What else do we need? Well, two things we should discuss. On the one hand side, is, uh, I should mention that in many cases you have difficulties finding programs or tools that allow you to really plot these ternary diagrams. So if you want, if you have exact data and you want to represent them in some diagram, uh, not all tools that you may be using allow you to plot these ternary diagrams quantitatively. In that case, you can resort to an ordinary access system because you have to keep in mind, of course, that we are still in the two-dimensional region. Actually, there are only two independent variables. The third composition always is determined from the summation condition, so only two independent variables. And of course you can plot them in an ordinary um, access system with perpendicular axis. So you can plot, uh, so to speak, the um, your miscibility gap and everything in an access system like that. I, I exaggerate a little bit. So where you say, well, this just corresponds, say, to x3, and that corresponds to x2, running from 0 to 1, running from 0 to 1. So they do not have to be, uh, ha do not have to uh, be scaled the same way. And then, of course, all the points and everything has to add up to unity. All the points have to lie more or less within this triangle. It's a little bit exaggerated, so the scaling here is much different from that. In principle, you would choose them more or less identical. But anyway, even in that case, you are able to plot also the, the binodal curve, which in that case, type 1 miscibility gap may be looking something like this. And of course, you would also have your tie lines in that and everything. So you can represent everything in this diagram as well, no problem. Critical mixing point, possibly somewhere over here. So everything can be represented in this diagram in here as well. And of course, this way it's quite trivial. You just have two coordinates, you introduce them, you plot them in the diagram, you get all the points, fine, done. Um, but in this diagram you have to be a little bit careful because now the scaling of component 2, of component 3 and of component 1, yeah, if this here is component, this corresponds to component 2, this components to component 3, and down here we have component 1. Let me circle them so that we can distinguish them from all the other numbers. So these are our three components. Then, of course, we know the distance from this side to here scales that of component 1. So component 1 is scaled, so to speak, from 0 to 1 over here. So this distance here scales component 1, this component 3, and this component 2. So the scale factor for each component differs. They are all different. And it means if you want to read compositions from that for the three components, it's not as easy as before for the ternary diagram because you have to take into account the scaling factors. On the other hand side, I should say, all the things that we will be deriving for the design of solvent extraction processes, all graphical methods, all um, evaluations that we see can equally well be performed in this diagram, mixing things and the complicated, cons oh, well, I shouldn't say complicated, the slightly more complex constructions we will come up with, they can all be done also in this diagram quite exactly the same way as we will derive them for the ternary diagram is the equal-sided diagram. So if you don't have a fancy tool that allows you to plot ternary right diagrams, you can use this diagram as well, no problem. There's one thing I wanted to mention. A second thing we, I wanted to mention relates to the practical application with respect to solvent extraction. Because we will discuss it in much more detail in the next video, introductory to the solvent extraction, um, we have the freedom of choice for our extractant. And as I mentioned in the introduction to this video, I said we have a primary solvent which contains our transfer component that we want to remove somehow by adding our extractant so that we wind up with a raffinate and extract. And um, we are free to choose the extractant. And we choose it typically such that it is 
has an extremely low solubility in the primary solvent and vice versa. Why is that so? Well, we simply don't want to lose our extraction to the other phase and we also do not want to just uh, uh, transfer lots of the primary solvent into the extract. We don't want to have that because actually we want to separate that. That means that typically we have systems where the mutual solubility in the 1-2 system, lower axis, is essentially approaching zero. So there's no solubility of component 1 in component 2 and vice versa. If that is so, one can simplify the equilibrium description quite consider considerably and I should present how that works. In order to do that, I again have to carefully plot my ternary diagram, more or less equal sided, but it should also have a very horizontal baseline because then the construction gets most easy. Again, we have our components 1, 2 and 3. And now I have our binodal, according to the assumption we, that we just made, we said, well, 1 and 2 are essentially insoluble in each other, which means that the binodal will run along this side of the triangle more or less for an extended uh, length. Then, of course, there will be some shift. And then we are passing along that side down until we reach here component 2. So here we see component 1 and 2 are essentially completely demixing. They don't meet at all, more or less. They mix at all, at, less, uh, at least. And now we can also plot some tie lines in there. Again, just two, I guess. That's fully sufficient. And now I want to show how one can simplify that equilibrium. And what we, want to, what, what we realize is, of course, that here we have a binary system, the transfer component, which is component three in that case, in our extractant, in our secondary solvent. And here our uh, system where we have our primary solvent with the mass transfer component. So actually, we have two binary systems here and there. We can, of course, describe that with the loads that we have already introduced in our generalized uh, discussions. So we can use these loads or, loads or mass or weight fractions or Bancroft coordinates, whichever way you want to call that, and can try to, dis to transfer the equilibrium information into such a diagram. So a y over x. Okay, what we need also is, our di is a diagonal. Let me plot that. So that is just the diagonal. And then I should mention that the compositions here to the right, we want to relate to y. So we think that on this side we find our y's, and on that side we find our x's. Now how to transfer the equilibrium information from this diagram to this diagram? Actually, it's quite simple. Let's take some fancy color again. The y, we can say it scales from 0 to 1 somewhere over here. Well, not really 1, but uh, it's, it's a ratio. So actually, it's not really 1, but it scales anyway in that way. The height here corresponds to the y. So we can say that this here is the y. On the other side corresponds to the x, so the concentration of 3 in 1 in this binary system corresponds to the x. So we can plot a horizontal line here as well. Of course, now this is again on the y-axis, but we know, that, we know that on the diagonal x equals y. So actually the x can now be plotted in the vertical, intersecting exactly here on this diagonal. And then we know that one point of our equilibrium curve is this point where these two intersect. And of course, we can do the same for the second. Now it's getting a little bit crowded, but anyway, let's do it. So this is the x. Maybe we have to become vertical after that, mirror that, so to speak, with the diagonal, and we find the y over here. Then we find a second point somewhere here. And if we look somewhere, we also have a critical point here, where actually, well, x equals y, which is a point on the diagonal. And that means that if you plot our equilibrium curve now, in this yx diagram, it will overall look something like that. For this type 1 miscibility gap, it will curve down and hit somewhere the diagonal, and that is our critical demixing point, where x and y are becoming identical. Okay, so that way we realize if component 1 and 2, primary and secondary solvent, the carrier 
uh, solvents, if they are essentially insoluble in each other, we can transfer this ternary diagram into a load diagram and use that to essentially describe the thermodynamics completely for that system. We also realize that at low concentrations, well, the ratio of y over x is more or less constant, which means it approaches the a straight line. So if we, especially if we are at low compositions, low concentrations, then we can often assume that the uh, slope is constant, that the partition coefficient is constant, which then allows for all the simplifications that we have already discussed for the, in the generalized considerations, winding up the shortcut equations, essentially. So that we can um, apply that as well as a limiting case. I should also mention that uh, this is now for this type 1 miscibility gap. If we have a type 2 miscibility gap, you remember, I don't uh, construct it directly, but I want to uh, show it in principle. Uh, so if we have our ternary system, where we have our two branches of the binodal somewhere, something like this, for example, and something like that. In that case, actually, well, of course, the miscibility should be uh, large, but in that case, if we can also plot this in the yx diagram, and we, what we wind up with is more or less so y over x. If we assume that the 1 and 2 are uh, are essentially immiscible in each other, we are also able to transfer that. And if we find in what we find in that case is actually, we can also plot the diagonal. And what we find in that case is actually that the equilibrium curve is running somewhere, but it ends somewhere in the center of the diagram. It doesn't come back to because we don't have a critical demixing point. It doesn't end here. It winds up somewhere. So in the case where that is the, is happening. Uh, where we have a type 2 miscibility gap, equilibrium can typically also be represented in the yx diagram. As I said, it's not really corresponding to that, but in principle what I want to show is that the end point is here somewhere, corresponding, so to speak, to that end, to, to, to that tile, uh, tile line on this side, which you see doesn't really relate, but in principle it shows that this is somewhere ending somewhere and not on the diagonal. That's what I wanted to show. Okay, with that we actually have now all means all thermodynamic means available that we need to design the corresponding uh, equilibrium processes. And let me summarize what we have been uh, doing. I first of all show the full thermodynamics of a ternary system, and we know we are winding up with a ternary system at minimum. We can use a ternary or triangular diagram for that to describe the full thermodynamics, type 1 or 2 typically, uh, miscibility gaps. Then we can have an assumption, first assumption, that the carrier components are mutually insoluble, which then leads to the low diagram or yx diagram. I have shown how that can be constructed. And then also for, we can have a second assumption that we assume that the equilibrium in the yx diagram is linear. And in that case, we will have, we can analytically describe the equilibrium. And that leads then to analytical solutions or to shortcut equations. And we actually know how to derive it already because we did that already. So these are the three options that we more or less have to describe equilibrium for solvent extraction. And we will apply that. And for the ternary system, we have especially also seen that uh, we can use the auxiliary or the so-called conjugate line to uh, find the other endpoint of a tie line once a first endpoint is given from balance considerations. With that, I would like to say thank you for this lecture. I hope I reminded you a little bit about the thermodynamics of these ternary systems, and I hope to see you again in the next video.